This episode is brought to you by Kobo.com, your local digital bookshop offering ebooks, audiobooks, and e readers. I'm a feminist, but I enjoy the pain of a bikini wax because it makes me feel alive when I'm feeling sad about the patriarchy. <laughs> it's just a little. Ugh. Yeah. It wakes you up. Yeah, it does. It makes you feel really super alive. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, normally you do it for sex, but actually it can be Sometimes better than that. Sometimes I just do it because it kind of feels like I'm like testing my pain tolerance and I see my bravery. I, I'll tell you what, and feel free to have your husband totally cut this out, but I like to just <laughs> wax my ass crack. I love it. It feels great. And I just got a bikini wax this week. And um, the position that you have to get in you know, in order to have that happen is very intimate. Mm. And because um, you have to help. You have I mean, to... I don't just do the ass crack. No, no. Yeah, I'm not like, I don't have like, like, <laughs> what the, would that be like a reverse mullet, but in my butt? Or I don't know how to do like, it would be crazy. It would be really funny actually to have like a full bush and like coming out of your bathing suit and stuff and just like weirdly a super pristine yeah. ass crack. That is a look that is so funny. And it definitely, you know, directs the attention to where you want the action to be, I would assume. Yeah, but, uh, 100%. But I like it, but I'm still like, mm, you know, am I kind of like, am I like eating shit here a little bit? Should I not do this? And so I balanced it out by talking about climate change for the entire time. Oh. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. So you offset the waxing. Yeah. It's a carbon offset feminism. That's right. I like it. Yeah. I'm a feminist... And an agnostic, but sometimes when I imagine God, even though I know that God should have a vagina or even be a vagina, I just imagine King Triton from The Little Mermaid. (laughs) (laughs) The most patriarchal God. Daddy God. (laughs) Daddy God doesn't mind that I sold my voice. It's sort of like divinity issues, like daddy issues, but yeah. with the almighty. Yeah. Haven't we all got daddy issues with the almighty in a way? Sure. I mean, I, you know, I just can't, like, I just really recently thinking about it, I'm like, I cannot believe that I was raised up in a religion that told me that God was a man who wants me to say for one day a year, say sorry all day while I fast, which is basically what I have to do all day anyway, because I'm an actress. <laughs> is to just like starve and be like my bad sorry sorry (laughs) yeah Harvey Weinstein and God have a lot in common (laughs) I'm a feminist but I just watched Jenny Slate's Netflix special (laughs) Stage Fright which is absolutely incredible and it just so many incredible ideas in it and absolutely amazing ideas in it but I was distracted by how magnificent your outfit was a lot like it was Amazing! It's like these Thank black you. palazzo pants, yeah. like a wide-legged trouser. I'm fashion enough to speak in the singular. Mm. A wide-legged trouser yeah. and a silk blouse. It Look, looked like they were from the same story. Is they that are. They're, they who, are. Who were you wearing? It's a designer called Neely Lotan. N-I-L-I-L-O-T-A-N. Yeah, I really just wanted to wear something that felt kind of like classic, but had sort of a tremor of sexuality. It so has a tremor of sexuality. And I like showing my bra. I like that. And I actually wouldn't put that in like an I'm a feminist, but because there was a lot about women doing stand up where it's like for a while, it felt like if you're going to do it, you have to like kind of be the girl version of a boy or something and like wear a hoodie and just like don't fem yourself up. Yeah. But like, so many comedians have to me, I need to look like I'm not going to steal anyone's or, boyfriend. Right. Or, yeah, yeah like, exactly. And I just think the best way for me to always deal with that was to just say like, that's like a garbage law. I just say, I don't believe in that. I don't like it. And I, I don't relate to that. And I know how I like to look. And I just really like giving like, yeah, just like a little bit of like, this is my underpants and like, you don't control what it does and you're allowed to look at it at, at a distance. And I like, I'm just like, you're dumb right now a little bit. Like, I'm just, like, telling you that's it. Wow. Yeah, I like it. I like how it feels. I love it. (laughs) Yeah. And uh, do you have another I'm a feminist bomb? Do I have it? Oh, um, yeah, it's sort of, well, sort of embarrassing, but I really had to dig for this one. 
I'm a feminist, but one time I used my, I cried my way out of jury duty. Oh. Yeah. Tell me more, tell me more. It's such a bummer. Yeah, I mean, I was I was a much younger woman, um, and I just didn't want to have to do that. I didn't want to have to do jury duty. What did I you said, say? You had to have something to go with those tears. Yeah, it, well, I mean, so luckily I wasn't like, I'm just, like, afraid or anything like that, but I said, um, I cried and said that I couldn't do jury duty because I was supposed to go to Florida to visit my nana. And that she was really sick and that I just really needed to be there. I don't want to call white privilege on this, but I'm going to have to. I'm sure it's it's everything (laughs) bad. I mean, it's absolutely everything bad. That as like a 23-year-old pothead who just was like, there's no way I can sit through a thing. (laughs) Yeah, everything bad about it. I've always wanted to do jury duty because I've always imagined myself in the 12 angry men, only 12 angry women... Thank you. Mm. Sometimes the juror is a woman or a non-binary person, so shut up. Yeah. Uh, I've always imagined myself being the one that turns the jury. Sure. I mean, yeah, that's like a very cool thing. I I just like hate sitting in places. (laughs) You know, that's enough. That's enough. Yeah, I'm so afraid of being bored and I'm just like, what's it going to be like in there? I I don't know. No, I hear that. I'm a feminist. But when I'm in L.A., I always think I see famous people, but usually they're just regular people I'm imposing famous features on because I'm in L.A. And I think, is that? It isn't. Today I did a double take at a low-rent Robert Downey Jr. (laughs) And thought, what if it was him? And then, like, we made eye contact. And he said, I couldn't help noticing you there. Then he says, sort of, sorry if I was staring at you. I'm just sad because I've just broken up with my partner and I'm newly single. And she's going on a date tonight, and I know I shouldn't, that shouldn't matter to me, and that's her life, and that's absolutely her prerogative. And I'm trying to retrain myself, but it's driving me crazy, and I'm trying not to be that guy. And I say, yeah, I hear that. And in my head, I'm thinking, oh my God, Robert Downey Jr. is much more of a feminist than I would have imagined. And he has a better understanding of these issues than you'd assume. And then I say, would it help if you had a drink with me, and then you could pretend you were on a date? Right. And he says, yeah, that would actually be great. That would really be helpful. And I think, oh, God, I've got a show tonight. And I can't put Robert Downey Jr. ahead of feminism. (laughs) Obviously, that would be wrong. But then in my daydream, there's an earthquake, like happened last night. Did anyone feel the earthquake last night? So in my, yeah, there was a little earthquake last night. It was tiny, but um, I could feel, I mean, I don't know how tiny it was, but where I was, I could just sort of feel a little bit. And so in my, because this had just happened last night. So in my daydream today, I was like, there's another earthquake and there's a big announcement over these city loudspeakers that say, everyone has to stay where they are. All shows are canceled and will now be on tomorrow night. Great, so we still get to do the show. It's just been put off by one day. The safest thing you can do is go back to your hotel room and get into bed. (laughs) Or house. And Robert Downey Jr. says, oh my God, my house is an hour away. And I say, well, my hotel is right here. And I don't want you to get hurt physically when you've just been emotionally hurt. And he says, thank you so much. You're lovely and very pretty. My name is Robert Downey Jr. And I say, I know I'm Deborah Francis White. We've both got three names. Yeah. What are the chances? And he says, I know who you are. I'm a big fan of the Guilty Feminist podcast. Mm. Why do you think I say such feminist stuff? <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's, that's the story. That's the little... And wouldn't it just be amazing if right now one of us said, ladies and gentlemen... <gasps> he's not here. He's not here. He's not here. He's not here. No. no. I mean, car. he wasn't where I was either. It was just a man who looked <laughs> nothing like him. <laughs> Live from the Wilshire Rebel Theatre in Los Angeles, the Spontaneity Shop presents The Guilty Feminist with me, Never Francis Wright, guest co host Jenny Slate, and very special guests Chanel Miller, Lana Nordstrom, and Monica Maletsky talking about credibility. This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. 
I'm Deborah Francis White. With me is Jenny Slate, and we're talking about credibility. Hello. Hey. Thank you so much for coming to do this. Thank you. Do I take this thing out of here? I do, just because I feel I'm a bit more casual. Otherwise, I feel like we're all like soldiers sitting there oh, like this. I definitely you know, feel can't. like I'm being like depositioned if I keep it up. It does have a little bit of that inquiry feel. Yeah. I, I feel it makes you feel this a bit like Mark Zuckerberg. Much more relaxing. Trying, trying to explain why Facebook's not evil into a microphone yeah, under pressure. Yeah, impossible. He can't do it. <laughs> no, oh, he definitely can't do it. No. On account of it being evil. It's evil, yeah. But yeah. in this country, that doesn't seem to matter as much as it absolutely should. Oh, I've, sure. I've only, You've noticed. I've only noticed that some of the facts get confused here with some of the absolute error I lies. think you're just being hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a bummer what's going on here, I'll tell you that, in, yeah, in the United States it, of America. It's certainly interesting and special. Yeah, um, it's. I mean, the Mark Zuckerberg thing really blows me away because it's like, dude, you actually could be a hero. Like, you could... If you just, like, make a few policy changes, you could be, like, a huge hero. I think he's more interested in being an evil genius. Right. I always forget about evil genius. Yeah. Because I always think that. I think if Jeff Bezos just said, I'm going to pay my staff a good, strong wage, and I'll still be, like, a multi-multi-billionaire, everyone would be like, you're... Because the bar is very low for a white man. In yes. terms of what he has to do to impress us. Right. Like, even if he's a multi-billionaire, but he's just like, I'm just going to pay my staff, like, I don't know, what's minimum wage in this country? $7? No, it can't be. That's minimum wage, is $7? All right. Okay, all right. This is not the price is right. This is not... <laughs> I, I don't know. Nobody here knows what minimum wage is because no one here is earning it. That's big clear. $12 in California, thank you very much. And that's categorical. That woman said that with an absolute definiteness. Yeah. She said that as if she was a man at a meeting who didn't really know. Right. And we've all... We've Go all, with it. hundred percent believed it. That's, yeah. that's fact. And if it, in fact, if it isn't right, it will be law by tomorrow morning because of the way she said it. That's They're right. It's like, hundred percent, it's 12 bucks, uh, which is not enough. So if Bezos just turned around and went, all my staff are getting 35 he'd still be the richest man in the universe by some way, and everyone would think he was some kind of giant hero. Yeah. And I'd be willing to give him any sexual favor he, he wished for. Sure. For, you know, just, I mean, just for one night. I'm yeah, not gonna... no, just one night. Just, you know. Is that a good high concept film? One Night, one with, night Bezos? with Bezos? Yeah. I think you would have to, like, do, like, a play on words, like, something about how it, like, you know, overnight shipping. <laughs> something and I'll tell you what I am actually the worst person at wordplay I don't seem to understand what a pun is and apparently according to some of my friends I'll say something and go no pun intended and they'll say that it no wasn't, pun at all. you didn't have a pun no pun there at all. wasn't a pun there at all no to be intended so or no one intended. cares if you intended it because you didn't wow. do it is it like when Joey from Friends doesn't know what the air quote marks does? So he just does that? Does yeah. Like that? You know, I, actually, that is one of my pet peeves is when, like, on a handwritten sign, people are like, we have air conditioning with air quotes around oh, air yes. conditioning. It's like, are you, what? <laughs> yeah. Like, are you making fun of me? Are you, are you like, <laughs> air conditioning? Like, what is it? It just underlined it is what. If I put air quotes around air conditioning, we have air conditioning, that would mean we have an open window. Right. Like yeah, it feels like, like, a, like a joke, a yeah. prank, or just, it just it doesn't make sense. Yeah. They're trying to reinforce something, but they're undermining it. That's right. Fundamentally. That's right. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you very much for coming. We're talking today about credibility. Yes. Uh, do you ever feel like you have credibility in an area or lack credibility? I feel that I have credibility when talking about romantic relationships, even though up until now I have only failed <laughs> at them, including getting divorced. And I have a zero success track record in a way, but I feel like I have credibility there. But that's not a gender thing. And in general, I mean, maybe I just feel this way from, because I started to be a comedian right when I graduated college, like I was 22. Mm -hmm. And I really obviously noticed right away that stand-up comedy is a, you know, it's like a performance genre that is dominated by men. Mm -hmm. And I really started to know for sure that my comedy, although sometimes it's about my gender, really comes from my nature. Mm. 
Mm. And while I think that you can't deny that sometimes you are given credibility that you don't deserve because of your gender or whatever, that I have worked pretty hard to keep it in like a silo for myself, Mm. that it is just, um, I just think I'm credible because of what I have experienced. My vagina or my gender is not really a part of that. But I will say I give a lot of relationship advice and then people are like, what? (laughs) (laughs) But you, didn't you? And it's like, yeah, no, no, I know, I know, but... Uh. But in a way, that I think that makes you a better at relationship advice. Yeah. Because you've done some trying and some testing. Somebody who meets the love of their life, who's exactly right for them at 18, and then just they just sail through life with that one person, what do they know about relationships? All they know is how to be married to Bill or Sandy. <laughs> yeah. That's, what do they fucking know? They know how to be married to someone who's right for them. Yeah. Which is, you know, great for them but doesn't give them any practical advice. If you've had a series of relationships which have wound down yeah. or exploded, sure. <laughs> then you, each time you're learning, you're like a scientist in a lab, experimenting, collecting data. Yeah. I trust you a lot more than this one over here who's like, we're so in love and we have been for 25 years. All right, good for you. Yeah, that's right. I've all, done a bunch of test runs, you know. Exactly, soft yeah. launches. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. all, I feel this a little bit with Tom. I know how to be married to Tom Selinsky. That's all I've got for you. If you are going to marry Tom Selinsky, I have a handbook this big. If you want to marry my husband, I can tell you everything you need to know. If you want to marry any other human being in the world, you're on your own. Because I only know how to please Tom Selinsky, and I don't even know how to do that most of the time. <laughs> like, I'm probably four days out of seven, because we're still together. He hasn't walked, so I reckon four days out of seven... I'm a pleasure to be with. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that sounds wonderful. Yeah. And I mean, I've been on tour for a month. So, uh, you know, and that really is good for the relationship because he misses me. Yeah, missing people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I miss him too, but, you know, it, it, I'm the one on the road. Right. You know, yeah. Having fun. He's the one, you know, at home going, where is she? Oh. You know. Yeah. It's the same if he goes away. You know, there's a hole where that person should be. But there's no hole in Chicago where Tom should be. So <laughs> I've there's made tons of holes in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> no pun intended. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> Kobo.com is a digital bookshop encouraging you to stay home and read rather than go out and mix with lots of people without a mask on. It has lots of great audio and ebook offers. The Guilty Feminist book is available in both formats along with all other books on your to read list. Are you a feminist writer? Well, Kobo is home to Kobo Writing Life, a very easy to use platform for authors to independently publish their own books. So maybe you could publish your own book there. It makes them available in the Kobo store for readers and listeners around the world. And it is open to all writers. Kobo's even gone to the trouble of creating a great list of feminist reads and listens over on kobo.com forward slash p forward slash guilty feminist. We can also enter a competition to win a Kobo e-reader. And they sent me one. And I have to say, I love it. You can also check out the Kobo Writing Life podcast and go to the website kobo.com forward slash writing life. Thank you so much to our wonderful friends at Kobo for sponsoring the Guilty Feminist podcast and keeping us going during lockdown. Jenny Slate has written a wonderful book. Would you like to hear something from it? Then please welcome to the stage the wonderful Jenny Slate. So I should mention that in my book, which is very much about me being alive, there are probably um, six or so pieces called I Died. That's not real, although I did write this book like a lot while I was depressed. Um, I realized that I wanted to get kind of close to the phrase, I died without people like thinking that I was actually going to kill myself. But like, I was like, some things are happening that really make me feel so sad that they're kind of like killing me. And so this is a piece that I wrote about having to listen to sort of a false ally or a misogynist who um, wants to stay in the center of a conversation that is not about him. It's called, I died listening. I died. Oh, God. I did 
die. Some man was standing right in the middle of the room talking about how he knew that now was the time for men to listen. And he was proud to say that he knew how to listen, but strangely, he kept talking for so long. <laughs> and I was the one who was listening. And so then what happened was that my head twisted around on my neck and faced the wall. <laughs> But that didn't seem to bother him, and it certainly didn't stop him because I guess he was on a roll. And then he just walked around to the other side of me and kept talking. <laughs> and what he was saying was so obvious but backward and wrong. But to tell him that would have caused a big bust up. And even though my head was on backwards and my brain felt, you know, not at its best... I was still aware that two very bad choices were being shoved at me. Tell him that he's right, or at least on the right track, and therefore lie and also abandon myself and cause more damage by letting his ignorance and monologue go on forever, or tell him, no, he is not even close to correct, and that the fact that he is pontificating and instructing and not actually conversing is a sign that he does not even remotely understand. But then after saying that... I would have to weather the storm of his humiliation and frustration and somehow end up feeling bad about myself, like I should have been gentler and treated him like a child who simply doesn't know any better. Or should I have been grateful that he was interested in talking about listening at all? But then again, he was demanding to be treated like a man who does know how to listen but he was asking me to only listen to him and lie to him and maybe give him a prize. And I was so chilled by the reality of having to choose between bad and worse that my heart became flash frozen and then it cracked in half. And so what I'm basically saying is that my heart broke almost right away. And then I thought, oh, great. Now I've got a backwards head and a broken thingy. <laughs> I tried to sit very still, but inside of me, the blood couldn't go around because there was no working heart to pump it. And he was still talking. <laughs> Even still. And what happened then was that my backwards head, which was already under a fair amount of stress from facing the wrong side of my body, and only offered a bad view, which was the man, <laughs> and then the wall. Well, my backwards head sort of tore off at the neck and dangled down, just hung there for quite a while, which was unsightly and embarrassing. Oh, no, I didn't want to look ugly. <laughs> the man was getting irritated because I guess I was making a face and rolling my eyes. But what was hard about that was that my head was dangling upside down. And so my eyeballs were, to be fair, rolling around. <laughs> he started to ask tense, defensive questions, to which the answer was clearly supposed to be, no, no, the problem isn't you, it's other worse men who do crimes and things like that. Although it was him, and it is probably all of us. All. As my eyes rolled back in my head and I saw into my own mind, I caught a glimpse of some old messages scrawled on the walls in there, and I thought, the bad thing has gotten into all of us and we all need to get it out of us. And when I started to think about how it is certainly all of us that have a bit of this bad thing in us, the shards of my frozen heart really began to prick at me, and my dangling head became as heavy as a wrecking ball. And then my head just completely disengaged from the rest of me. It fell off, and it bonked down onto the floor. I felt it roll slightly away, but I didn't know how far it had gone, and that was stressful because I wanted to have some control over my head. But I didn't want to be rude by kneeling down and feeling around on the floor for the head because that might make it seem like I was distracted or not listening. And the man was already so strangely angry, even though I was the one falling to pieces. And everything he was saying was in favor of keeping himself together and also never changing, even though everything he was saying was being said to dismantle and delegitimize the humane system I believed in, the one that demands equal rights and good old-fashioned empathy, the one that would strip him of his excessive privileges, the one that celebrates things being various, multi, plural, open, and requires him to explore being truly vulnerable. 
I wanted him to understand that being vulnerable is a different thing for everyone, is a developed and specific skill involving personally specific actions that are terrifying. But I couldn't really get a word in edgewise, as they say. I really did feel concerned about where my head might be, and I could feel my blood as it stalled inside of myself. I was taking a breath maybe every three minutes, and I started to worry that, you know, this was not going to work out for me because that's just not enough. (laughs) It's nowhere near the amount of breath that he was getting to suck in and snort out. But then again, I didn't want to seem like I wasn't being attentive because... Recently, I had let the man in on a terrible secret, which is that many men interrupt and disregard women and do it religiously and don't even notice that they're doing it, but also gain power by doing it, even if they do it without thinking, without what I guess you would call consideration. And so now, if I ever interrupted the man, he would tell me in my own language how painful it is to be interrupted. He would explain in a voice that sounded so much like my own, how I am not considerate, even though I am considering a lot. And yes, that would confuse me, because he would sound just like me, even though he wasn't me and had never had any of my experiences or experiences even much like my own. I was now in a position of being a hypocrite if I didn't honor his experience of my experience. In an effort to be helpful, I had revealed the terrible secret, and I guess it made the man feel so scared and defensive that all he could do was to appropriate my whole experience as his and then accuse me of starting the problem. (laughs) My eyes were still rolled back in my head, which was somewhere on the floor, so I couldn't see it, but I heard him say that he felt unseen. It is hard to even describe what it's like to have someone use your own revelation of suffering as a way to accuse you of being cruel. It doesn't even matter now because my head fell off and I'm dead now. But I must say, I really did not start it. No woman started it, by the way. I can say safely from the comfort of the great beyond that patriarchy and misogyny are neither the fault nor the invention of women. Get out of here. Get out. Get right out of my life with that and get the hell out of my death with it. Let me rest in peace and quiet. Where was I? Oh, yes, yes, yes. So then, even though my head was lost on the floor somewhere and the thoughts had spilled out, some of them were trying to jump up back to me. But in general, it was a poor showing, and the thoughts I had got a hold of didn't seem to really go with each other, and I gave up. But just when I was about to surrender to the whole experience and accept that my head had gotten away from me for good, I realized what was happening. I took it seriously, and from my head on the floor, I screamed, I see that you are trying to kill me. I see it. And then I saw the whole of the thing that had happened, not just to me, but to so many people. And I, well, honestly, it was so incredibly overwhelming that I just stopped caring about what he thought. And I went right ahead and felt around and finally found my head. And I cradled my own head in my arms. My face nuzzled into my breasts and my hands stroked my own brow. And I comforted myself in pieces. I looked up past my heart and past my former headspace and into the sky, and my mouth still had a voice, and it murmured to my heart, it doesn't have to be like this. And then I died, and actually I have no idea what he did. He might still be talking, so if you are alive out there, I'd advise you to try to keep your head. Jenny Slate, everybody! Thanks. Jenny, what's the name of the book and where can we buy it? Oh, the book is called Little Weirds and it's out through uh, Little Brown. That's the publisher. You can buy it on their website or I would suggest, you know, like buy it in any uh, independent bookstore that you might go to. Judging from the Bezos conversation we had before, (laughs) I would say support your local booksellers or yeah, just through the Little Brown website and um, thanks. I absolutely can't wait to get that. It, that was a really beautiful and evocative piece. And I feel like, does everyone relate to that? Yeah. <laughs> so I've never heard it put like that before, but I feel like, I feel like everyone can relate to that. 
Um, it's beautiful. Our guests today, and we have three, are all exceptional women. Monica Boletsky has written for numerous TV series, including I Am The Night and The Leftovers, and has an overall deal with Apple TV. She was nominated for an Emmy with the Fargo team and also shares two WGA nominations with her Fargo and Friday Night Lights colleagues. She has two features in development. Lila Nordstrom is a Los Angeles-based writer. In 2006, she formed an advocacy group called Stwy Health. Am I saying that correctly? Thank you. We'll edit out that. Uh, which represents students who were exposed to the World Trade Center cleanup after 9-11. Since then, she has worked to raise awareness about issues surrounding access to health monitoring and treatment for 9-11 victims. Her efforts have been honored by the Manhattan Borough President and featured in the New York Times, Economist, and many, many, many other impressive places. She's written about these issues for both the HuffPo and The Guardian. Chanel Miller first came into the public eye anonymously after she was sexually assaulted on the campus of Stanford University in 2015. The victim impact statement she wrote and read at her assailant's sentencing hearing the following year went viral after being published online by BuzzFeed. Miller was referred to as Emily Doe in court documents and in media reports in this very famous case until September 2019, when she relinquished her anonymity and published the best-selling memoir, Know My Name. She is credited with sparking national discussion in the United States about the treatment of sexual assault cases and victims by college campuses and court systems. Please welcome to the stage Monica Boletsky, Lila Nordstrom and Chanel Miller. You can take the mic out if you want, uh, so you've got a little bit of freedom, or you can sit with it in. You can Zuckerberg it, or you can, you know, <laughs> Seinfeld it. It's up to you. So, could you just all introduce yourselves for the podcast? I'm Monica Bletsky. I write uh, for TV and movies, and I'm an old friend of Deborah's. Um, I'm Lila Nordstrom. I'm a 9-11 health advocate and writer, and I ended up on this podcast because I wrote a long rant to Deborah, my first ever podcast fan email, um, in which I explained some of the gender dynamics of the health advocacy biz, um, and she invited me to be on. Hello, I'm Chanel Miller. I'm an artist and the author of Know My Name. So today we're talking about credibility, and Monica, this theme was actually suggested by you, and you're writing an incredible screenplay about Maleva Einstein, who was married to a famous man called Albert Einstein. Could you tell us a little bit about why you suggested credibility and about what the screenplay is about? Several years ago, I was looking for something to write, and um, I had just written on Parenthood for four seasons, and I was looking for something that I could write for myself, you know, that was sort of my own project. And so I was browsing through the bookstore, like remember when we used to go to a store to buy a book and not mm. just get it instantly on a screen. And I came across the love letters between Albert Einstein and his first wife, Maleva, who I'd never heard of before. And they looked really adorable on the cover and their letters were so sweet and, and just really intoxicating the way they corresponded and everything because I didn't have text um, and uh, anyway so as I was reading those letters I was sort of blown away by some of the things I read and I'm gonna read a couple of things if that's okay yes please okay in August of 1899 Albert wrote to Maleva I find the work we do together very good healing and also easier in 1900 her best friend wrote Miss Marriage and Mr. Einstein have now finished their written examinations. They devised their topics together, but Mr. Einstein relinquished the nicer one to Miss Marriage. And then in September 1900, Albert wrote to Maleva, I look forward to resume our new common work. You must now continue with your research. How proud I will be to have a doctor for my spouse when I'll only be an ordinary man. So as I was reading the letters, I started to see these you know, references to our work and us and we. And I was, you know, like, wow, this is blowing my mind. What does this mean? So I spent like three years just completely obsessed with their story and researching it. And 
I even went to Zurich and I followed like every address I saw in their letters. I went to sort of follow their footsteps and um, what ended up happening was I wrote the screenplay and really started to believe that it's very possible that she's uncredited with the papers that he wrote that are considered the thing that made him a genius. The theory of relativity. Yes, and um, there's another paper in the same year. He had this year called the Miracle Year, 1905, and so it became very amusing to me that it was more likely to the physics establishment that a miracle happened rather than a woman, a woman, a woman contributed. A man. Yeah. <laughs> I That's, mean, the chances are that yeah. God sent a lightning bolt. Daddy God. <laughs> Daddy. Sorry. From the Little Mermaid. Sorry. Yeah. The, the merman. <laughs> The yeah. merman year. The chances are that a man with half a fish body, <laughs> <laughs> rather than just a brilliant woman. Just a brilliant woman who was there with. Yeah. So you started to find all of this evidence that he had said our work and that kind of thing. Why is this not more widely either talked about or accepted even? So what happened was they went to college together. She was the only woman in his physics department. And they have this big exam, which they had, and she failed one of the tests, and that meant she failed the whole thing. Her number wasn't high enough. So that was around 1900, I believe, and that's when she and Einstein had told his family, we're together, I'm in love with her, I want to be with her, and his family, especially his mother, completely rejected that idea. So Why didn't they like her? His mother said that she was too old because she was older than him. And also she was Serbian. She was born with a congenital um, disability. So she limped. She was an ethnic minority. She was foreign. So it could be any of those things. She was considered plain, you know, her look. So I think his mom wanted him to marry this girlfriend he had at the time, a similar time, who was like blonde and wanted to be a housewife. And because Einstein was so hot, <laughs> he actually he deserved a He bait. actually was a little hot was back he then. Hot? Yeah, if you look it up, look it up. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah <laughs> I mean, I don't know what your taste is, but but <laughs> he was objectively hot. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm like like I can hardly wait to look this up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm a little aroused just hearing about how hot this man was. Because um, we think of him as old Einstein, but right. actually, a bit like Churchill. You look at Churchill when he was younger, you know, yeah? you, you would. Well, that's the other thing. That's the other thing that surprised me is that I didn't know that the things that he's really, really known for, the thing that defined Einstein with genius, he did at 26. He didn't mm-hmm. do it with the gray hair and the tongue sticking out. And that, and that was this time period. Okay, so he, so he didn't do all of the genius things he did with the big hair and the tongue sticking out. There were times when his tongue was in his head and it was <laughs> right inside. Uh, so <laughs> do you think it is sheerly a lack of credibility because she was a woman in science and there were hardly any women allowed in science then and she'd sort of managed to push her way in? But why didn't he advocate for her? Oh, sorry. So I didn't really finish that part. So basically, she failed the test once. He was like, try it again. So... She took it the next year, and she was three months pregnant with his baby. And They were unmarried. And they weren't unmarried. Scandalous then. And, you know, maybe that was around the time where she was starting to show, and the professors knew what was going on. And so, you know, we don't know. Like, did she really fail the exam? Or there was, I think, this was a long time ago, but I remember there being a little note in one of their transcripts that said something about discipline. And I was thinking, like, I wonder if, they were disciplining her for, you know... Getting pregnant. For getting Getting pregnant. Getting knocked up. Right. And in my script, I have a scene where she needs to use the restroom because when I was pregnant, I had to pee, like, every five seconds. And um, there was no women's restroom at the university. God, it sounds really hidden figures. Yeah. So uh, she failed that exam and didn't get a degree. And then um, they end up having a child... We don't know what happened to her. And then before Albert Einstein's father passed away, he gave his blessing, you can marry Maleva. And so they got married, and he had sort of been such a kind of jerk to all of his professors, he couldn't get a job in the university. And she was actually, the reason why he said, you'll be a doctor and I'll be an ordinary man, is because she was actually primed to work with this 
other professor, and he kind of saw her career going in a way where he could live with her being the PhD. Um, but it didn't work out because of the pregnancy. Anyway, so they end up getting married, and they had, were working on four papers in college, dissertation, thesis. In 1905, he had four papers that are the papers that he's considered to be the miracle man, the miracle year that was the first relativity paper, the E equals MC squared paper. No physicist in the entire history of the world has had as good of an output, a more revolutionary output in one year than him. And so when I saw, like, well, they were working on four papers three years before. She didn't get her degree. She didn't do anything with her papers. And then all of a sudden, they're married, and he has four of the best papers of all time. <laughs> you know, it's, there is some doubt there, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then in the end, when he was getting a divorce um, with her, he promised her the money from the Nobel Prize, and that's how they settled the divorce. So that was all very compelling to me. Mm -hmm. and um, That's what she accepted, because they were debating, and then she said, if you give me the money for the Nobel Prize, I'll go away. And that sounds to me like what I would accept if I knew that I couldn't actually get the Nobel Prize due to being a woman, a woman without a degree, because I got knocked up by Albert Einstein's genius sperm <laughs> while I was in the middle of my college degree, thinking, why don't I fuck this guy? And uh, uh, it's always a man at college, isn't it? It's like, yeah. Oh, he's such a genius. He's so hot. And so she died without the recognition right. for anything. But right. your screenplay is examining, as far as you know... How it could have happened. Yeah. And did you speak to any Einstein experts when you were talking about I this? I did. Um, my agency put me in touch with an Einstein expert, and I didn't realize until I was in the middle of the conversation that he was actually one of the prime people who has argued against Maleva co-authoring with... <laughs> I was thinking like, oh, I should get off the phone with this guy because clearly he's not going to help me. But actually, I had three long conversations with him and it really helped me form my arguments because he was so strong in his. And so he would say something to me like, you have no proof or whatever, you know. And so I had to come up in my imagination with how it could have happened, you know, because a, a big thing that they'll say is, well, she failed a math test, so how could she be good at math? And... I don't know how you guys are, but I've certainly done badly on tests. And that doesn't mean, you know, like I got a C in writing my first semester in college. I'm a professional writer. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't mean because you did badly on one test that... I suspect a man is responsible for all your work. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just saying. It They're just doesn't add up, Monica. It doesn't add up. You Male once got a else. C. Yeah. Yeah. Your husband is writing all of your screenplays. Yeah. That's all that I can assume now. So the professor, you know, he actually really helped me come up with some scenes, actually, because he would say, you know, like, well, how did she fail the test? And then I would think, well, because she just had this huge row with his mother and, like, you know, mm -hmm. the whole thing. And so it helped me kind of imagine it. But he also admitted to me his own bias, which is that he had had an affair with a woman who was a physicist in his department. And he, yeah, he told me this. <laughs> wow. And sorry, the, sorry. The, the Einstein expert mm -hmm. <laughs> shared with you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, People tell sure. me things, Jenny. Yeah. I don't know what it is, ah! but they, they just tell me things. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So he said, <laughs> what is his own bias about? He said, this is so Here's, interesting. He said, I, I, well, I kept coming back to the sentence where, I don't know if I read you that one, but it's basically like, how happy and proud I will be when our work on relative motion comes to its wonderful conclusion. This is what Einstein said to Maleva. Einstein said, Einstein said this to Maleva. In writing. In writing. So I said to the professor, who is alive now, well, shouldn't we take Einstein at his word that he said, our work? And he said, his excuse was, yeah, but see, when you're in love, you're in the flush of love, like, you give the person you love more credit than, than they would really deserve. And I said, you know what, in my experience, I've never really met a man who's sort of, like, generously wants to give me more credit than... Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. And in fact, it's usually the opposite. Mm. I dated Sebastian Fawkes, and he wanted to give me credit for half of Birdsong. <laughs> I said, no, Sebastian Fawkes, that's your novel. I didn't write a word of it, but he wanted to put both our names on the cover. 
that's how good I am in bed. <laughs> yeah, so when you fall in love, you know, you just get a lot of credit for things, but... <laughs> Which man ever in the history of the world has gone, you're really good in bed, have half my Nobel fucking prize. <laughs> that's not what they do. They go, look at my Nobel prize and suck my dick. <laughs> You're sucking the Nobel Prize dick here. Be grateful. That's what they say. I know. So his story was, I fell in love with this woman in my department. I was mentoring her, and I really thought she was kind of like a Maleva. She was brilliant. And then we sort of had her falling out, and I started to see that she was not as brilliant as I once thought she was. Oh, really? Really? He's projecting a lot. Yeah, once I don't fancy you anymore. I said, I said you know, it's you're not the same people, right? Like, yeah. like, maybe the woman you were with is or isn't a genius, but she's not Malevin. You're not Einstein. You know that, yeah. right? And also, I'm now wow. questioning how much she contributed that he didn't want to credit her with because she stopped sleeping with him. I'm not saying that happened. That's alleged. <laughs> That's alleged. You know, so who knows, but... I just couldn't believe that her story was so discredited by someone who was admitting to me that he might have had this bias, mm -hmm. but it's sort of been like, well, that's open and shut now because mm -hmm. I don't think so. Well, I'm very excited to see the screenplay made into a movie. Lina, you were at a school in the cleanup area during 9-11. Can you tell us about that? Sure. Um, I was a student at a school called Stuyvesant High School, which was about three blocks from the World Trade Center. We were there on 9-11, but the major controversy surrounding Stuyvesant was that we were also one of the first schools to return back to the neighborhood during the cleanup. Uh, we returned in early October, on October 9th, so less than a month after the attacks. And we were there through three months of fires, about eight months of cleanup. They did not clean our school building, they didn't clean the vents in the school, they didn't replace the upholstery in the theater, um, and the whole time they just sort of told us, no, 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 don't worry, it's safe here, it's fine. We said it was fine, the EPA said it was fine, and then in 2003 the EPA admitted that they had lied about how safe the air was in Lower Manhattan, they had known that on September 18th when they declared the air safe to breathe that they were exaggerating the truth a bit. Um, there was a lot of economic pressure to send people into the area at the time, and we kind of got swept up in that. So we basically, you know, went to school right next to the barge that they brought all the debris from Ground Zero to for eight months during the middle of the World Trade Center cleanup, and then we had to spend 20 years fighting for health care for it. Wow. How do you feel like you have become a voice of credibility for the victims? I think that really emerged in the last year, and it emerged for a very specific reason, which was I got kind of pushed to the front of this discussion because for this last legislative round, we had to explain why this fund that's a compensation fund for victims um, needed to be extended for 70 years. So for years, you know, members of the community had sort of been like the ugly stepchildren of this conversation. There are three to four times as many people who were impacted by the bad air in the community as there are first responders. So it's a very expensive sounding problem. And they, in this last cycle, finally sort of had to admit that there were children down there because they needed to explain why the funding had to continue for 70 years as opposed to, you know, the 30 to 40 that would have satisfied the responder population. Because you were a senior in high school. I was a senior in high school. There were 20,000 public school children in the contaminated zone, so there were students that spanned every age range. But um, I was the oldest minor victim, or the, you know, in the class of the oldest victims who were minors at the time. So you had some heft because you had age on you? Right. In terms of gender, how do you feel of being a spokesperson for something like this? One of the weird dynamics about this conversation is that most of the responder advocates are male and most of the survivor advocates, and that's the term we use to describe the community, are female. Probably if you've heard about this issue at all in the media, it's been all about first responders. You've probably heard John, John Stewart. Stewart talking about first responders. You know, when he testified before Congress, I also testified at that hearing, but the women went first and then the men closed. And so we literally got seated by gender and the media sort of was meant to pick up the end of that, was meant to, that was supposed to be the compelling part. But the fact that I got all the questions in the, you know, in the room and the fact that people were really engaged in the survivor story in the room never really got 
portrayed to everyone else. So there's sort of a, an aspect where we kind of require the responders to go and tell our story for us because they're the people that can actually get the word out and have the credibility to walk into congressional offices and say, like, kids were down there and that's unacceptable. But a lot of the time, I've spent a lot of the last 15 years essentially like lobbying first responders in the hallways of Congress so that when we walk into a meeting together, they will make sure to retell my story after I've told it so that the staffer will know that it was a story worth hearing. Wow. People really didn't like that one. That's it. No, no. But so what a man repeats. Yeah, I mean, it's so funny how like overt a lot of this misogyny on the Hill is. i have walked into many rooms where, and I've been a visible advocate on this issue for 15 years, but I've walked into so many rooms where politicians who, when I was 22 and first started speaking out about this, offered me jobs and were very excited to see me speak at their press conferences, has like forgotten to shake my hand in the, you know, in a row of responders because I just don't look like what people think the face of this issue is supposed to look like. But I think a lot of that has to do with who we consider to be credible victims who we consider to be valuable victims. I don't think that communities are considered valuable victims. I think that without first responders to kind of ride the coattails of in this, our community would have gotten nothing. And that's, we're still talking about a fairly wealthy, you know, very white community in lower Manhattan. I mean, what are kids in Flint supposed to do without first responders? Yeah. Certainly there's not even someone who has the level of credibility that I was able to have to go in, you know, having gone to mm-hmm. fancy schools and having the right education and seeming like a credible person in that context. We just sort of like, we have a, a very kind of biased sense of who has enough value to extend services to, and mm-hmm. we don't offer a lot of these services. Well, you were saying that the projection thing. of... Uh, one of the reasons you were an advocate that was listened to was whiteness, was race, because there were oh, lots of black and brown and Asian people who were in that same neighborhood who were not listened to. Oh, I mean, I think one of the reasons that all of all of the survivor advocates who got airtime at all were sort of from this one specific sector of the community. And I didn't live in the community. I only went to school in the community. But I went to a high school that was vastly majority Asian in, you know, a neighborhood that was right next to Chinatown. And you do not hear that community discussed in this issue at all. Um, You do not hear the communities of color that are located in the district discussed at all. They have had to fight tooth and nail just to make sure that the boundaries don't exclude them entirely. But I at least had the ability to kind of walk into the room and be taken seriously enough that I was a credible child, you know, victim. That's, I mean, it's so awful that that's the case. It's just so tragic and awful. But a lot of times I hear people now sort of saying, I don't have white privilege because I grew up poor. I don't have white privilege because of this or this. And like privilege is a hot potato to be dropped. Like it's a time bomb. But privilege is a power. Privilege is a wonderful thing to have. It's a steamroller where you can get things out of the way. The question is, are you just getting things out of the way for you and people like you? Or are you getting things out of the way for other people? If you have any privilege at all, and we generally all have some privilege, whether it's we didn't come here in a wheelchair or we're straight or we're gender conforming or, you know, it, whatever, if you have any privilege at all, use it to move stuff out of the way. Don't like, go, and then touch it. You know. So, you know, you, the caucasian that you have <laughs> if you can lift something out of the way for somebody who isn't going to be heard and bring them into the conversation, then absolutely do it. Is there anything we can do to help you? At this point, the most important thing that we can do is A, make sure that if you have any 9-11 survivors in your life that they're aware that there are federal health services available to them. But also, the big issue here is that there's not a lot of basic health care protections in American society. We don't have any kind of national health plan that protects people that were in my situation as a matter of course. Of course not. That would be socialism. That would be madness. That would be be communism Um, and madness. And the one thing that you can do for every class of disaster victim is advocate for policies that increase access to health care. That is beneficial to kids who have been in school shootings. That is beneficial to kids who live in Flint. That is beneficial to anyone who's experienced an act of mass violence or an environmental disaster. The one thing that they need in the aftermath of that is a continuous access to care. And that's not something we provide. Right. So we need to advocate uh, our representatives for that. Can I ask you, uh, Chanel Miller, to tell us a little bit about your story? 
And I, this is a feminist podcast, so I'm only going to say these two words once, then I'm never going to say them again. Brock Turner, done. Because I just want to contextualize this story for people who have heard those words. And now take it away in your own words. Okay. I graduated from college in 2014. And I moved home to live with my parents in Palo Alto. And I was working at a startup. And one weekend, my younger sister came home and said, let's go to this party at Stanford. We had lots of friends at Stanford. It's practically in our backyard. So we go to this party. It's so janky and dank. There's like juice dispensers, and I'm like slapping them. And I make this juice called dingleberry juice. And I'm distributing this. It's non alcoholic. Well, then I found Smirnoff, and that was very alcoholic, and consumed that. Go outside to pee, come back in. That's like scene. Um, I woke up in a hospital. I had pine needles in my hair. And they said, you know, we have reason to believe you've been sexually assaulted. I said, oh, no, thank you. I'd like to go home. And they said, well, you need to get a rape kit done. I said, okay, fine. So I undergo this, like, multi-hour invasive process. And at the end, the detective comes, and I say, hey, you know, what's going on? And he said, someone had been acting hinky. That's the word he used, around you. Hinky. And he had been chased off and tackled, and he has been arrested. And so my impression was that there had been a strange man at this party who was now in jail. And so I thought, oh, that's very odd, but I feel very grateful to be released. Mm -hmm. And I go home, and 10 days pass, and I don't hear anything. And then I'm at work one day, just like typing away, and I see a headline and read about how I'd been found half naked behind a dumpster being humped by this man before he ran away. And like he literally ran away. Like he was humping me and then just said like, peace, bye, you know, like I'm out. And I thought, oh, that's like, that means guilty. But instead I had to undergo this like excruciating long criminal process that took a year and a half and um, resulted in him serving three months in jail for three felonies that he was charged with. And then after that, I spent the next three years writing a book and that just popped out and then I'm here. This book's called Know My Name. Mm -hmm. uh, for a long time, we knew his name and we did not know yours. Mm -hmm. But what kind of feminist uh, stirrings inside of you made you want us to know your name? Well, I think the primary reason for anonymity is safety and privacy. But I think long-term, your sense of self becomes very depleted. It can be very damaging to be that anonymous, to not be fully known and we all deserve to live authentically I shouldn't be the one having to conceal this story mm -hmm. and I also thank you yeah it's just very suffocating to imagine spinning the rest of my life inside because I was scared and it's still scary but I deserve the right to connect with people and meet with people in person, and I have, and I enjoy it. And they deserve to know me, too. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad I met you because you encouraged me to wear my little blue bow around my neck yeah, like a little Yeah, she took present. it off, and I was like, where'd it go? We had a, what, yeah, great bond. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> Dressing rooms with women in them are amazing. It actually is a very, it's like a very lovely thing, yeah. not yeah. to minimize it, like very lovely to get to meet all of these ladies and um, we all do such different things, but there is that push to live authentically, mm -hmm. which is so hard mm -hmm. uh, and so many people just don't do it because I think their pain or anything that like, especially for women, like presents as like heavy or ugly yeah. is just not accepted mm -hmm. um, as something that can be put into the center of where we all live. But it is part of who most of us are, you know, that whatever our pains are. But anyway, I feel really privileged to be sitting up here. Yeah. 
even though I'm the clown. <laughs> no. <laughs> and not at all. Your piece was, I'm sure, very resonant for all of the guests. Yeah. Uh, um, what, can you tell us a little bit about what your book is about and what you needed to say within it? A lot of people come to me and say, oh, I, I wish I had been more courageous or reported. And I always say it's not about your courage. And there's so many obstacles along the way. Something that I thought was very clear-cut ended up being extremely long-drawn and emotionally traumatizing. How could you expect yourself to undergo something like that? And I had resources and support at every step of the way. I had males testifying on my behalf, who had literally witnessed what had happened, and it still was excruciating. So if you carry that kind of, I should have done more, no. You know, we need to be doing more for you, and you need mm -hmm. to know that and be proud of yourself for doing whatever you need to do at that time to survive, because that's what you're doing. credibility was a real issue in this case because he was a Stanford student and his credentials, his sporting credentials were brought to the fore and therefore his punishment was, was sort of risible really when you think about what would have happened to somebody who didn't have that tent pole of credibility of an Ivy League college, I don't know if Stanford Ivy League but equivalent, uh, his whiteness, you can imagine how different that would have been if that were a black man his family connections. How much do you feel like that sort of head-to-head -head credibility is an issue in terms of gendered crime? We talk a lot about due process for the perpetrator. We say he is innocent until proven guilty. We give him the benefit of the doubt. So then I think, well, where is due process for the victim? Because often we presume that she is lying until she can prove she's telling the truth. So if we are required to believe that he is innocent, we should also be required to believe she's telling the truth until proved otherwise. Does that resonate with you, Lila? Because it's a similar thing, it's a legal battle. You're a survivor, you're dealing with victims, some of whom didn't survive. Do you feel like that issue of credibility is always there in as much as are you putting it on, are you telling the truth, would you have had this problem anyway? Yeah, I mean, I think definitely any time that, and this is, I think, in part because we, we have a system that kind of requires us in the area that I was fighting to kind of compete in cage match style for limited resources. And so a lot of the time, the question was not does anyone believe this has happened who was down there. The question was sort of in telling this story, how can I tell the story in a way that makes clear that I'm not exaggerating it? Mm -hmm. It sounded so fantastical and ridiculous to people that a bunch of kids would be put in such a dangerous situation by the federal government that a lot of the time people kind of dismissed it immediately as out of hand. We had a little bit of trouble kind of overcoming that initial disbelief because we didn't expect to find it in this case. This wasn't a situation where we thought we would face the kind of resistance that we faced to getting us help. It was a little bit shocking the way that it came in wave after wave after wave. We kept having to go back every five years and ask again for more help and more money, and it never seemed to be like the story was enough. So actually not dissimilar to Chanel being like, are you somehow complicit? Are you somehow to blame? What did you drink? What did you wear? The two pieces of the law that are sort of fighting each other. I mean, obviously everybody deserves a fair trial and we want to live in a society where everybody deserves a fair trial. But as you say, if the victim is unilaterally not believed, because she's one, which we never have with housebreaking or anything like that. That, it, that is specifically gendered and it's specifically about violence towards women that was she asking for it in some way or has she made it up as she advances. If someone says, oh my God, I came home and the door was kicked open and my television's gone, nobody goes, did you do that yourself though? <laughs> Are you Sometimes to me they do that <laughs> because of how much weed I smoked. Right, right. Like, did you just leave this in a mess and think you got broken into? Yeah. yeah it, it, Did you just take your television outside to watch it because you thought that would be pretty? <laughs> there was nowhere to plug it in. Then you were like, why am I outside? And then you walked somewhere else. 
left the front door open. Then you came home and go, I've been robbed. Right. Yeah. So it, it can happen, guys, and that's what's important, <laughs> yeah. gang. So just always check. Flash. If you think you've been broken into, just check, do I smoke a lot of weed? How stoned <laughs> are you? Uh, and did you take your television for a walk? Yeah. Uh, that could have happened. One time I hard-boiled an egg for 48 minutes. Yeah, that's, that's and a very it exploded. Hard egg. Yeah, that will happen. That, yeah. that will happen. That will happen. Um, yeah. Monica, you've talked about credibility in a way that you've summed it up in a way that I've, I've, I've not heard before and I think it was brilliant. Can you replicate that now? No. Okay. <laughs> Sorry to put pressure on you. I'll now. try. I just had this notion that credibility is like the kryptonite for abuse because for abuse to take place, the abuser has to be able to take advantage of a lack of credibility. So there's an imbalance in gender credibility in our society. So like studies have shown like a man and woman in the same job, the man will be taken more seriously saying the exact same thing as a woman, you know. There's racial credibility that I kind of equate with this notion of white privilege. Like I think that phrase has a lot of like, people can feel very defensive about that phrase. So whenever I see it, I replace it with credibility because I feel that in the same situation as someone who's brown versus someone who's white, that white person will have more credibility, and that's the privilege. So they can be struggling to pay their bills and not have, you know, class privilege or something like that. But if there's something at Home Depot and it was stolen and it's like, well, it's you or that person, that person is going to have, because of the color of their skin, a level of credibility that someone brown or black is not going to have. So there's a sort of question to ask yourself. Do I have more credibility in this situation because of my race, because of my gender, because of... Uh, my finances. My finances, my education, my accent. Uh, <laughs> my, this accent only works in this country. I have more credibility here. I have no extra credibility. <laughs> Although some people would say I do because if I had a regional accent in the UK, yeah, there are absolutely certain regional accents where people go... Mm, Mm, less credible. Um, yeah. Where will you lack credibility or where do you have it? And where do you have it? Look for it. Look for where you have extra credibility and use it. We've got to start looking for whatever privilege you have. Look for it. Where do you have credibility and how can you use it to fight the fight? Because this is a time we need to fight the fight. <laughs> this is the credibility I have now from applause. Uh, this is a very uh, American thing. You guys have applauded so many times. <laughs> In London, none of this would have gotten applause. They want to hear their hands on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. It would have, it, in London, it that would have got me. a gentle nod of recognition. We'd be like, mm -hmm. <laughs> you'll hear those nods on the podcast. Thank you so much to everyone who's contributing via Patreon. We had our second monthly Zoom hangout last week for our top patrons, and we're doing a special hangout for all patrons on the 2nd of July at 8pm London time. Places are limited on that, so look out for a message coming via Patreon very soon. And we have new merch coming, which will be exclusive to Patreon supporters for the first two weeks. I'm also on the Cameo app, where I can make videos for friends and relatives, and 100% of the fee goes to Choose Love. So far, we've made $4,500 for Choose Love, so thank you to everybody who has booked a Cameo video. And finally, my book is available as a book, an ebook, or an audiobook, wherever you buy those things. It's called The Guilty Feminist. And if you would like to support me but are not supporting Patreon, please check that out. And now, back to the podcast. Can I ask, has anybody come here to say something they haven't said, or is there anything else you want to say? I don't want anyone to leave here feeling they haven't left everything on the table. Please vote. <laughs> it's not strictly related to what I came here for, but, but it vote. is important. And could I add, vote well. <laughs> Just think about who you're going to vote for. Now, we're not here to tell you how to vote, but definitely don't vote for Trump. I'm on an O1 visa. I can't put that on the podcast. It's not going to happen. Chanel, is there anything else you want to say? I just say a lot of people may try and dismiss your story. I know for me in court, they'd say you have a little hole in your memory, so shut up. And I said, no, I will not shut up. I'm going to write a whole book. 
instead. And um, pun, 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 pun. Oh, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. All puns intended. <laughs> Woo. You can clap, guys. You can clap. Sorry, I feel I've stifled your clap. Stifle the applause. Let it out, Americans. Let it out. Woo. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, so if there's a hole in your memory... I mean, the thing is, memories, <laughs> memories have holes in them, actually. We, right, we know that. But it doesn't that. make your story less legitimate. No. Right? So... You should just stand by your truth. Don't question your truth. Just because it's fragmented or emotional or whatever, it's still yours. And so you should own it. Wonderful. Monica, is there anything else that you want to get off your chest while you're here? You know, one thing I was curious because of the stories we're telling and, and the credibility thing, I'm just curious how many people out there have felt that if they were, you know, in their family or at work where they have had an idea or something and not gotten credit for it or the credit was taken or mm-hmm. somebody else said it was their idea. Because I just think that notion in that story of Einstein is still so relevant, you know, mm-hmm. and I, I think that um, just thinking about what Chanel's been through and everything, it's just like, what do you do with the anger, you know, and what do you do with the feeling of, you know, how much we have to fight for credibility and fight for telling our own stories and not having them taken by other people and them getting credit for and stuff. So I'm just curious. So let's ask the audience. The way we tend to do it at The Guilty Feminist is everyone closes their eyes and then if you've ever felt that credit has been robbed from you or taken or someone's just taken credit and you haven't had an opportunity to get that credit for anything, just go, hmm. And the reason we close our eyes is because then it doesn't expose anyone and if you're sitting next to the person who stole the credit, they won't know if you're umming or not. (laughs) Okay, ready? One, two, three. If you have, go, hmm. If you haven't, go, mm. Oh, only men. <laughs> it was a lower, mm. It was. It was. It was Either that or someone was just really enjoying it. Like, they're just like, oh. My ki- my- no one's ever stolen shit from me and I'm horny about it. <laughs> oh. My king's getting credit for all my ideas. Um, and then maybe we could do the same thing for credibility. Like, if you felt you were in a situation where whoever yeah. you were wasn't enough so the question is have you ever felt you've lacked credibility because of something inherent to your identity just say mm, now if you feel you haven't say mm, now oh it's men again that's so interesting <laughs> if you're a cis man and you feel like credibility is not an issue for you could you say mm? okay can you say mm, again if you're white oh wow <laughs> You knew that was coming, though. But listen, you guys, great, super. If you are a white, straight, cis man who is not disabled and you feel you have lacked credibility because of some essential part of your identity, could you go, hmm, now? Oh, what was it for? (laughs) Where did you lack credibility? Just so... Age. Too young or too old, sir? Too young. How young were you at the time? (laughs) Twelve. Well, it could be abuse. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. We won't delve any further, but that's interesting because sometimes children are not believed about very important things. Well, also, like, my husband, I think, as an audience, he's all of those things, but he was a refugee, and so that mm-hmm. is another situation where I think... I'm adding displaced to a lot of my... Li- you know, when I say... I'm yeah. adding displaced because I live with a refugee, and, you know, like, I understand the, the lack of credibility that you end up with because, you know, you can get criminalised going over any border or in just random situations where none of us would be criminalised, and you've done nothing wrong ever. All you've done is come through trauma. Anyway, that's not a fun way to end. Uh, So is there anything anyone else wants to ask anybody else on this panel as well? Backstage, I asked Jenny how she pitched her book, and I thought that was so interesting. And I was curious, Chanel, with you as well, did you pitch your book or...? Somebody called and was like, I'm your agent. Agents get credibility. They phone up and go, I'm your agent, I represent you. And you go, sure. And she's like, I need a book proposal. I was like, oh, I didn't even know I was writing a book. And so, so then I went home. She was like, it's due Monday? And you were like, shit. I guess I have to do that work now. I had plans for the weekend. Not anymore. My agent just said she needs the pages. 
And then he went home and went, oh, I'm an agent. Still, better time. I'm a woman. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. That's how you get a book deal. Jenny? Yes. Is there anything else you want to say before we finish? Anything else you need to get off your chest? No, I don't think so. Uh, I've said a lot of stuff tonight that I am already regretting. <laughs> I don't think I should say any more. No. But we all know how to get a, out of jury duty now. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's that's right. majorly one. I'm like, oof, that's a bad... Oh, no, it's great. It's really unpatriotic. Um, in a real way, you were not in a fit state to do jury duty because you just said you were, you were smoking too much pot. So. Oh, my God. Yeah, I mean, there's no way I could decide who did what, including no. myself. No, indeed. <laughs> so let's just quickly go around. Uh, Chanel, where do we follow you? And where do we uh, find your book? Instagram. Bookstores. <laughs> Thank you. So on Instagram, you're Chanel Miller, know my name, all one word. Oh, yeah. And uh, go to a bookstore that pays its tax and pick up a copy of that book immediately. <laughs> can I ask you, Lila, where should we follow you and uh, can we buy your book? You can buy my book next year when it comes out. When you've written it? When I've written it. Uh, I, the, the first draft is due in a week from today. <gasps> oh, what are you doing here? I, oh, my God, go home now. <gasps> I, you've no, not written I'm, it. I know I've written I'm, a book. You've definitely not done it. A Stuyvesant alum, and I most definitely already have a first draft written. <laughs> I was going to say, you, you're done already. <laughs> I don't want to hear from you ever again. You've written your book ahead of deadline. I oh. do everything on deadline. I have to, it's like my, it's, that's the Stuyvesant curse that you have wow. to complete. Um, but you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Lila and Chelsea. Um, and I also do a podcast about electoral politics with my best friend. We know we're really wonky and we know way too much about it. It's called Brain Trust Live and it's also available on the interwebs. Great. Uh, Monica Boletsky, what can we do for you? How can we follow you? How can we find you? You don't have to do anything for me. Um, you dedicated your book partly to me, so. I did. That was very special. At Monica Bletsky on Twitter. That's At right. Monica Bletsky on Twitter. That's and right. uh, you're currently setting your movie up with Franklin Leonard from The Blacklist. Right. Uh, so if any movie producers want to get involved, come on board. I feel like the women of the world are going to go down to the box office and eat the box office. <laughs> Uh, you will definitely make money if you make this movie, and that's what you're interested in. I know that because I've been to L.A. before. <laughs> you don't probably, if you're a film producer, you may not give a fuck about this story. It doesn't matter. It's going to make money. It's going to win you awards. <laughs> I think that's what's clear. So, you know, and if you do care because you're a feminist film producer, then you are even more welcome to make money from this. I should say it's called Equals, like E equals MC squared. Oh, that's so and good. Equals. Equals. Oh, I love it. It's good. I'm sold. Can I put money into this? I've got a hundred pounds. Um, Jenny Slate. Yes. What can we watch? Where can we follow? What can we do? What can we read? Oh, um, you can watch my special on Netflix. It's called Stage Fright. It's so good, you guys. It's so good. Cool. And yeah, and you can buy my book. It's there's an audio book and a physical copy of the book in bookstores. So go buy that book. Jenny's in a bunch of stuff. Go to her IMDb and watch it all. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, thank you to everyone here at the Ebell Theatre. <laughs> Live Nation, who've made this tour possible. Uh, a very good friend of mine and uh, somebody who I love working with who, uh, in fact, uh, introduced me to Live Nation, Siobhan Barkman, who's in the audience tonight. And... Can I please have a huge round of applause for Chanel Miller, <laughs> Lila Nordstrom, <laughs> Monica Bolesky, <laughs> and the incredible Jenny Slate. <laughs> you have been listening to The Guilty Feminist with me, Nova Francis White, guest host Jenny Slate, and our very special guest, Chanel Miller, Lila Nordstrom, and Monica Bolesky. The recording engineer was Devon Bryant. Music was by Mark Hodge. The producer was Tom Selitsky for the Spontaneity Shop. Thanks to Dave Ocken, Lance Grozovich, and everyone at the Wilshire Ebel, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. Thank you very much. That's our show. This has been an absolutely amazing tour. You've been a wonderful last stop, LA. Uh, you really have been brilliant. I've been Deborah Francis White. We've been the Guilty Feminist. Good night.
I, I, you know, I'm, I'm like just too freaked out to speculate on that. Yeah, I, because I just feel like, although this microphone is only connected to like this, whatever thing is connected to, that it's probably we're being listened to. Oh, well, yeah. also it's a podcast. I mean, we're being listened to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's. We- yeah. yeah. We're being listened to. But yeah. Thank you very much again to the wonderful Kobo.com, your local digital bookshop offering ebooks, audiobooks, and e-readers. Why don't you go and buy a great big old pile of feminist ebooks right now? <laughs>